Hello, welcome to another video where today we're going to be talking about uh, something I don't often go into detail and that's um, lung capacity. So um, there's a good reason I'm talking, bringing this up. It's um, something that's uh, it's been, you know, probably top of people's minds recently with the coronavirus. Um, um, you know, as we know, it's really attacks people's respiratory systems and the older generation and people with um, history of uh, of respiratory problems are the most at risk. So, you know, a lot of people going to the internet looking for ways to improve their ability to um, um, improve it. So, um, it's one of those things, a bit like our heart, we don't really pay attention to it, um, or all our vital organs for that matter, um, and, and the, the, the role that they play. It's not something we we really pay attention to till something goes wrong, you know, but, um, you know, and it's, like the rest of our body, it's it's something that really needs our attention. Just about anything that runs 24/7, it means you really should be paying its attention to the little things that that make it um, keep functioning at its optimal performance. So this is um, this is where I'll quickly touch on the autonomic nervous system. So sort of the name suggests what it what it does, but basically it's a it's a, the system that just that runs without us having to consciously think about it. So, so for example, if we had to consciously think about turning our heart or making our heart beat to pump blood, um, we would we wouldn't be able to do anything else. You know, so so the system's sort of designed to run on its own without your brain having to think about it at all. And um, so the system does th things like heartbeat, blood flow, breathing, for example, you don't have to consciously think about breathing. You don't have to consciously think about digesting foods and stuff. So all this stuff happens on its own. But um, if we don't look after these systems by paying attention to the little things that keeps them running at their, perf their the, the way that they're supposed to, things start to go wrong. And then when there's a, an infection or a virus, you're you're really highly susceptible to a you know to something really disastrous going wrong. So so it's really important to know what these things are. So I'm going to be specifically talking about just lungs. So not really looking at these other systems because you can sort of see here there's quite a few of them. Um, sometimes we spend a lot of time on say the muscular and the skeletal system, but these ones. Uh, probably the least significant compared to these other ones because if these ones go then we're in a lot of trouble. Um, so so if we're talking about lungs there's sort of a thing a difference between lung function and lung capacity so they're not the same thing a lot of times they're actually brought up and you know and I used to think that they were the same but they're not so the Lung Institute defines these two measurements as follows. So lung function is a metric determined by the amount of air your lungs can hold and how quickly you can take it, take it in and release air from your lungs. So as well as your body's ability to oxygenate and, redu and remove carbon dioxide from your blood. Where lung capacity is the maximum amount of oxygen your body can use. So in simple language, this is how I would just simplify that, that definition for you. Lung function equals how your body uses air, lung capacity is how much air your body can use. All right, so the big thing here though is your lung function can't be improved. Once it's gone, it's gone, all right? But your lung capacity, however, can be controlled and improved. So, so what we're talking about in this video is lung capacity because lung function is, like if you're trying to constantly improve this and it hasn't deteriorated to a point where you're on respirators and you know things like emphysema and stuff like that, that's a case of lung function that, that can't be improved but if you're not at that point we can do things to improve your lung capacity and even if you are at this point we maybe can improve your lung capacity your lung function may never be the same but um, you know it's really important never get to that point at that point in the first place so and that's what a lot of the things I'm talking about this video are going to be about so firstly breathing breathing as much as we get air to breathe and that it feeds oxygen to every cell in our body so Without sufficient oxygen, people are very prone to health problems, so respiratory illness, chronic pulmonary disease, and even heart disease. So, it's it's the critical thing that we need. So, if it's it's the most important. That's why when at first aid responders, the first the first thing they're trying to do is breathing and and get your heart circulating. They're the two things that keep us alive. So, you know, you see, and both of them are running or, or automatically all the time. So. 
So breathing normally is not enough to just keep it running to you know improve it or um, you know make sure it even sustains its peak level. Um, so there's a good quote here that I've got on this slide. So this is from a, a medical doctor in, in the US. So basically he's saying lungs at rest and during most daily activities are only at 50% of their capacity, um, which you wouldn't want them to be at 100% of your capacity. You'd be pretty screwed if they were. So, um, so like the rest of your body, lungs thrive on the movement and activity. So like, like if you want to make your biceps stronger, just reading a book's not going to make them stronger. They need, they need activity and they need resistance. They need something that forces them to adapt and change. And your lungs are no different to any other thing um, in your body. If the, the more challenge it has, as long as it's wisely, if you overdo it, it creates problems. All right. So, so you can't just go doing crazy stuff. You've got to be sensible about it. But the the main point is here: it needs activity. So, the regular day-to-day -day activity doesn't help use your lungs to its full capacity. And if you want to improve lung capacity, you need to challenge it. So, and also it's very important here to counter up the the act. You know the the build-up of toxins and stuff in the environment, and pollution and dust and cigarette smoke, for example, all these things, uh, you know, get stuck in our lungs. So if we have a, a exercise to help remove them and make our lungs function better, um, then that's a good thing. It helps us combat the environmental things that we we can't avoid. So. So before you just go out and try and crush yourself with exercise and think, okay, Nick's just said I need to challenge, I'm just going to go and hammer myself, you really need to understand how to breathe just normally and how to breathe correctly when you're normally breathing. So a lot of, a lot of people have no idea what a good breath and a normal breath is. So it's very simple um, peak visual here is this girl's got her mouth closed, breathing through her nose. This guy's got his mouth open, breathing through his mouth. This is a good way to breathe, this is a poor way to breathe. Even if you're exercising, the longer you can keep your mouth shut, the better. There will be a point when you, when you are exercising where you will have to open your mouth, but the longer you can avoid that, the better, the fitter you'll be and the, the more health benefits you gain from it. Um, so normal breathing, right? And this is another thing where we see people changing their breathing to stop their belly looking big. So they end up pulling their belly in all the time. It's about the worst thing you could ever do for your diaphragm really end up reversing your breathing and it's um, you end up doing this on the breath in it's like completely the wrong way around so just understand when you breathe in you should breathe in through your nose your belly should rise all right that's probably the simplest way just think breath in belly rises when I breathe out belly descends all right that's very simple <laughs> explanation of breathing um, so there's another visual here of belly so breath in breath out so Concentrating on how to use your diaphragm, very important for developing core strength and stabilization and all these other things as well. There's a lot of things about the breathing that I'm not going to touch on in here, so I'm just talking, talking about lung capacity, but understand that that diaphragm is a muscle like anything else, so um, if it's not used correctly, it creates a multitude of problems. But in terms of lung capacity, by concentrating low your diaphragm as you breathe in, you'll get a much deeper breath and a more prolonged breath. And this is the technique that professional singers use and to increase their lung capacity to hold the really long notes, say as an opera singer like Pavarotti. All right, so, so it sort of gives you, a, you know, if people have trouble breathing into um, a breathalyzer, you know, uh, that's an example of they don't probably have very poor breathing mechanics, don't use their diaphragm very well. All right, so this is an ex example of just learning to breathe correctly improves your lung capacity without even exercising. It's just learning to change the way that you do it. Um, breathing through your nose. So um, again, I'm just touching very quickly on this. There's a lot more to it than what I'm going over. But but basically, the people who are mouth breathers never really can develop their lung capacity. And it also prevents them from creating nitric oxide. Now, nitric oxide is found within your nose. And you carry when you breathe in, you carry a small portion of this gas into your lungs. And this is very, very important because this is one of the things that helps um, maintain the pH balance in your body, so the acid and alkaline balance. Um, when there's a disruption in that, it's when you get a lot of a lot of um, things going wrong. And again, you're susceptible to infections, you know, skin problems, uh, things like that all become an issue when that pH is all out of whack. Digestion's a huge problem as well. So so this, the breathing through your nostrils, because it's a smaller um, gap, more or less, you just can't get more, as much um, breathing uh, oxygen coming in all right and uh, it, it sort of helps you to learn how to 
create smaller breaths that, that last longer. So it's like a calm and it's a quieter breathing, whereas mouth breathing is really too, it's too much air. It's, um, and you end up getting a dry mouth and bacteria all from it, where when you keep your mouth closed, you have a lot of saliva. And it's in, in Chinese medicine, they call that, that's referring to qi. So good qi means you've got like a, a very good saliva. Um, bad qi is you've got a dry mouth. All right, so this is a, a good book here I've put here. If you want to know more about that, I really suggest getting that. That's a great book. That's part of the Buteyko method, but very simple, very good explanations. Lots of info, statistics and studies that confirm all of this. It's not made up. Um, so over breathing, mouth breathing, also going hand with snoring, sleep apnea and things that really destroy your sleep. So asthmatics, because they have a restricted airway, this, they feel like they're getting strangled. They've got like a, no, they're struggling to get air. They have to open their mouth to find more air. Um, anxiety, same problem, they're breathing too much. So they're, they're actually getting too much volume in. But So in asthma, it looks it's the restricted airway that's causing, but with other people, it's just poor breathing mechanics. And um, in both cases, you're gonna become a mouth breather. So you know again i'm not going into all the details of asthmatics and all that and what you can do but just understand it's very difficult to build lung capacity if you're until you can sort of learn to try and breathe through your nose that's um that's what this book's trying to help shows people how to you know to control their asthma not through ventolin and, and medications as much but through a breath of better breathing mechanics i'm not going to say it's easy but it can be done and there's a lot of people in around the world that swear by it and i've known many people that do um, so what about nutrition so it's another thing we, before we touch on exercise. Fiber is a huge part, right? This is something that a lot of people are not aware of, you know, and they're just poor diets, processed foods create that problem of that acid and alkaline pH balance is all disrupted. And, and to try and break the crap foods down, they have to breathe through their mouth to get, because they just can't break it down. Um, there's lack of fiber in it. So there's lots of studies being done on this. And, you know, there's one here that I found that had, 2,000 adults and they found the low fiber intake was associated with reduced measures of lung function, while the, the diet with a lot of fiber showed that there was a, an improvement. Um, so the best sources of dietary fiber come from veggies. However, most people don't eat it anywhere near enough, so supplements like psyllium husk can be a great, and I'm gonna to touch on this quickly in a minute, but this is a great addition to anyone's diet. You should be doing both of these, to be honest, but um, this can really help the person who doesn't eat enough veggies. So anyway, in the study, they found 68% with a higher fiber consumption had normal lung function compared to only 50% with the lower fiber intake. 15% of those who ate the most fiber had airway, had, ate the most fiber had airway restriction compared to 30% who ate the least amount. So it was almost double. People who ate a lot of fiber scored better on two breathing tests, indicating large, larger lung capacity and the ability to expel more hair in one second. In this study, the high fiber group was consuming a roughly 18 grams of fiber per day, uh, which is probably a bit on the low end. You'd probably want to be around 20 to 30 grams of fiber per day. Understand also improves, you, you know, um, your digestion and, and digestion is another big critical factor in terms of immune system, you know, being really um, supercharged to fight off virus and infections. So now I quickly touched on the psyllium husk. I use this myself, have used it for quite a few years. I, all I need is one teaspoon of this a day. I add it to my muesli in the morning for breakfast or if I don't have the muesli that day, I might have it in a drink later in the day. You, you can't taste it, it just sort of, it just dissolves into it. Um, or it doesn't actually quite dissolve. It turns into a paste if you don't drink it straight away. And you need to drink a plenty amount of water, uh, uh, enough water throughout the day, otherwise we'll, we'll actually block you up. Um, so, but a very, very good way of getting fiber into your diet. Um, and it acts like a prebiotic, so which is like how you help your gut to create the good bacteria, which again, like I mentioned before, helps build your immune system. So, and your function to fight off viruses and stuff. Uh, vitamin D, uh, amazing how many times this one keeps coming up and nearly any time we talk about health problems. Um, it's just that important to us and yet, it's not often it's not spoken about enough and you know people are, we always talk about sunscreen and skin cancers and covering up but a lot of people don't get enough sun to begin with so this is one of the easiest way to get vitamin vitamins is just spend a bit of time outside in the sun so there's a lot of foods that have that um that you know you can check in the description under the video i'll have links that you can look up more about this but 
but just be aware this this is you know there's a lot of studies again that showed higher vitamin D is, is shown to improve lung function um, it, and among many other things so it's a very important factor all right exercise so uh, so what do you need to do? Do you go out and do like a 10 kilometer run or ride for two hours and all that stuff? Well, a lot of that stuff would definitely help you. There's no doubt about it. Um, but it, it'd be nowhere near as effective as what interval training because it, all of those things that work on a very low intensity. So say, for example, here the treatment where they're just walking or they're just jogging, they're working probably, you know, 50, 60% of their capacity where the sprinter is going to be working close to 100%. They're going to hit a lactate point and go completely breathless within a short amount of time. But these people will be able to sustain it for a few hours. Yeah, sure, it's a building endurance, but it's not really proving the lung capacity anywhere near like the, the sprinter would. That's why it's interval training challenges your breathing way more that's why it's it's the chosen method of all elite athletes it's, that's their secret to their to their programs that beats that makes them better than the average person so then the reason it works is because there's a significant lack of air to in the arterial supply of oxygen is dropping the spleen senses it and releases more blood cells into circulation to improve the oxygen levels all right, so if, you, if you've ever done cycling up hills and you're going health leather, you'll know exactly what that feels like. I do it all the time. Um, and same again, like I said, with sprinting, you could do it. But it could be with um, going upstairs, it could be swimming, it could be, it could be boxing, it could be anything. Um, just something that takes me to that point of like complete breathlessness that forces me to stop is going to make some huge differences to my lung capacity. Um, this is where the EPO sort of comes up in cycling. You know, it's sort of become famous in recent years with the cheating and you know the Lance Armstrongs. This is exactly what they were using to try and get more oxygen into the bone, into the blood cells, to get into the working muscles, so they can sustain high levels of intensity um, without fatigue. All right. So this is this is so naturally it's just done from interval training. All right, so you don't need to go and inject yourself with EPO, you just need to use interval training. So um, now, like I said, interval training, it's relative. So, you know, if, if you're a 75 year old, you don't need to go hammer yourself with cycling up a hill. If you, if you can go for it, that's great. But, you know, maybe a fast walk might be all you need to do, you know, like, and that, that's not going to be anything for me. But for that person, you know, that, that's almost the equivalent of running for me. You know, they could, they could be taking the stairs fast. Um, it could be anything, all right? It's just something that takes you to that point of complete breathlessness and really makes you uncomfortable and forces you into a rest. Um, you know, and this, this is great for people who do have breathlessness problems because um, it does allow them to recover before challenging themselves again. They don't have to sustain like 30 to eight minutes to an hour. It could be just a minute. There's all they need and it's mentally that's a lot easier um, when you know that you get to have a break in a second. All right, so it, you understand you don't have to run and that. It's great if you can, but if, you, if your knees hurt, you could even use the gym. This is where I've got here. I could turn my strength set exercises in the gym into a circuit that also creates this huge buildup of, of um, oxygen depletion. All right, so I'm getting strength gains for sure, but it's probably the bigger problem is I'm going to start running out of air. All right, so if I'm a person that finds the gym works for me, you know, I've got my knees hurt when I run or my back hurts when I bike, ride, bike ride, but I can do gym things like the ropes or something. I, I might use them, structure them in a circuit to deplete me. Um, check out under the, again, in the description under the video here, I'll have some links for ideas on how you can do that. Um, but uh, there's many ways to do it. It's just the key is to make it uncomfortable and get breathless. So in summary, lung function cannot be improved. Once it's gone, it's gone. Lung capacity, however, can be improved, but it requires correct breathing techniques and, and, and activity to do so. So learn how to belly breathe, practice nose breathing, make sure you eat more fiber by getting more veggies in your diet, include a psyllium husk if you can, get outside, get some vitamin D and begin training with interval training as regularly as you can. You know, don't do it every day. I'd probably say three times a week is all you'd need. Um, and on the other days, just do your nice, easy walking, some strength training, perfect week. Your lung capacity is going to be incredible. Um, that would be, in a summary, that would be what I would recommend to do. You do all of those things and you do them well, you're going to be as best you can be. All right. So 
if you need any more ideas on training ideas and stuff like that, this go to our website. There's heaps of um, articles and free reports. These programs here, this one here in particular, gives you about 100 programs that you could use. So there's, there's a whole chapter actually devoted to interval training. Um, so you can find stuff about that in there. Um, but yeah, just go and check it out. There's heaps of stuff there to help you. But if you have any questions, just send me an email and we can um, see how we can help you out. All right. Hope you enjoy that video and we'll see you on our next one.